Alabama STEM Explorers is made possible by the generous support of the Hudson Alpha Institute for Biotechnology, Southern Research, solving the world's hardest problems, the Holly Family Foundation, Alabama Works, Alabama STEM Council, Alabama Mathematics, Science, Technology, and Engineering Coalition, Alabama Math, Science, and Technology Initiative, Catherine and I came back to the Birmingham Zoo because it was so much fun last time. I can't wait to learn about these giraffes. Thanks for joining us on today's episode of Alabama STEM Explorers. I'm Catherine and I'm here with my friends Cruz and Jesse. And Cruz and I were just here and we had so much fun at the Birmingham Zoo, we just had to come back. And so Jesse, we had a lot more questions about the different body systems of all of the different animals that we saw last time. Can you help us out? Yeah, absolutely. So one animal that people are always fascinated with when they come to the zoo are giraffes because they're just so strange looking, right? So here on the table in front of me, I have um, uh, a giraffe neck, so the cervical vertebra of a giraffe. Um, and so we can look at the different body systems like the, you know, the circulatory system and the muscular system and the, um, the, the bones, the osteo system, you know, of different animals and compare those uh, and see some really cool differences and some pretty cool um, similarities whenever we look across the entire animal world. Wow, that is amazing. I I knew that this was a giraffe, but I had no idea that this was just the neck. Yes. So uh, giraffes are what type of animal? A mammal. A mammal, exactly right. So all mammals, except for a couple of weird ones, uh, they all have how many neck bones? Seven. Seven, yes. So one, two, three, four, five, six, seven there. So all mammals have seven in their neck. Giraffes are just much bigger. Uh, here on the table, I have an example of a cow cervical vertebra. You can hold that one if you'd like to. And um, a human cervical vertebra. So when we talk about cervical vertebra, we're just talking about these seven right here in the neck. So the one that attaches to the back of your skull right up here, and then attaches to your shoulders right down here. There's seven right in there. So that's one from a human. Uh, so thinking about an animal that's standing, you know, 20 feet in the air, um, what might be an issue for this animal? You know, what's up here in the head that's super important for this animal? Uh, the brain. The brain, right? So what kind of issues do you think might arise from having a neck this long and having your head way up in the sky? I don't know. Don't know? What about, so what do you need in your brain uh, to make it work? Uh, so Electricity. Electricity. Uh, there are some electrical signal, signals up there, but what circulates all throughout your body that you need? Blood. Your blood, exactly. So one of the big issues that giraffe deal with is getting blood all the way around their okay. body, uh, all the way down into their legs and all the way up into their head. Have you ever been like sitting on a chair or laying in the bed and you stand up really fast? What happens? You get real dizzy. You get real dizzy, exactly. So think about an animal like this. Their head is 18 feet up in the air, mm -hmm. right? They still have to drink water, which is down on the ground. So they're moving their head from eight from the ground level, 18 or 20 feet in the air, yeah. right? And you're just moving maybe three feet out of the bed and you get dizzy. So circulation is a big thing that giraffes um, have to mm -hmm. deal with. And I have a little um, experiment that I wanna try to help illustrate that. Yeah. Okay. okay. All right, Cruz, so we are talking about giraffe, right? And those long necks and kind of the issues yep. that giraffe have to get blood up to their brains. So how does blood move around your body? Um, with your heart. With your heart, your heart is a pump right? And it pumps blood down to your feet, up to your brain, right? Our heart, our pump is about the size of your fist, right? So yeah. if you put your fist right here in the middle of your chest, that's about the size of your heart, right? This is the size of a giraffe's pump, a giraffe's heart. So this is a 25 pound oh. yeah. uh, medicine ball, right? So our hearts are pure muscle. 
So think about 25 pounds of pure mm -hmm. muscle uh, and how much blood yeah. that can move at one time. So we've got a little experiment here. So I said our heart is like a what in our body? A pump. A pump, right? So I've got just a plain old aquarium pump here with some tubing. Um, what, is your, what is your pump connected to in your body? Uh, um, what are those things called that yeah. go all the way through your body? Veins. Veins and vessels, exactly. So this is going to be like our blood vessel uh, or an artery, actually. Uh, there's an artery that goes right up your neck directly from mm -hmm. your heart, right? Because your brain is so important. It goes directly from your heart and your lungs right straight up to your brain, okay. runs right through your neck. Yeah. So giraffe have an artery, a carotid artery, that is super, super thick and muscular. So it actually helps the, the, the pump, the heart, pump that blood up to their brain. So what we're gonna do, we've got our blood here, which is just water. Uh, yeah. We're gonna put our pump in the water and we're gonna see what happens to the flow of the liquid, the flow of the blood as you change the height, okay? okay? So I'm gonna have you, we're gonna try to not get water everywhere, but we probably will. So I'm gonna have you control the, the blood vessel, right? Okay. Um, and so I'll have our blue bowl right over here. Um, and we're just gonna see how much is coming out here. And then we're gonna slowly lift everything up. And I want you to tell me what you notice about the flow okay. as we kind of change the height, all right? There you go. Okay. Uh, let's make sure our pump is down in our water. I'm going to plug it in. So hold it over our bowl okay. here. All right, here we go. Here we go. Okay. All right, so you can see how much blood is coming out, right? Yeah. So now let's lift it up. Keep on lifting. So what do you notice? <laughs> okay, you can set it down now. So what do you notice about the amount of water so that's coming out of the pump. It's getting stopped up, basically. Okay, so the it's getting stopped up, or, sorry about the water, yeah. or the amount is getting, getting less, yes. right? So the pressure that's coming from your, your the pump is having a hard time sending mm -hmm. as much liquid up to a height. So that's what giraffes have to deal with, and that's why yeah. they have a 25 pound pump in their chest to make sure that they can get their blood all the way up to their brain, which is sometimes 18 or 20 feet up in the air. Yeah. So why don't we go uh, meet a giraffe and see one up close? How's that sound? Yeah, that sounds great. All right. So hey, Cruz, uh, here we are up at our giraffe habitat with our three members of our giraffe herd here behind me. Uh, and you can see, obviously, those long necks that we were talking about. Uh, so the, the male that's laying down behind me, his name is Jaleel. Uh, the best way to tell him apart, if you look, you can see that he has very dark spots, yeah. little white spots inside. Uh -huh. uh, the one standing next to him is Zuri. She's one of our females. And then the third one kind of standing off by herself is Willow. Uh, she's another one of our females. So hopefully we're gonna get to go uh, see one of these guys up close uh, over at our giraffe feeding platform. All right, Cruz, so here we are on our giraffe feeding platform. Uh, you've got Zuri here. She's really wanting some lettuce, so you can go ahead and give her a piece there. And this is Willow coming over your shoulder here. Uh, so these are two of our giraffe herd. Uh, that we met earlier. These are our two females, uh, and you are the first person this season uh, to feed our giraffes. So now our giraffe feeding platform is going to be open to the public. Uh, people can come and, and feed giraffes here at the zoo any uh, any day of the week, right? Yeah. Uh, so we're up here. We were talking about blood pressure, right, with our giraffe and those long necks. Uh, so we're up here on the platform, about 20 feet in the air. Um, so those great big hearts that we were talking about, make sure that that blood gets all the way up to their heads here. Uh, <laughs> get some Missouri right over there. There you go. Uh, so these girls, giraffes, are uh, what we call um, browsers. So they're feeding kind of up in the treetops, uh, eating pretty much all day long, kind of cruising around. Uh, you'll also see those nice uh, purple tongues. So if you hold a piece of lettuce up nice and high, way above your head up there, we'll see if one will uh, uh, kind of reach out her tongue. If you hold it kind of up like that. Get a piece. Yeah, there you go. Hold it up high. Here you go. Yeah. <laughs> 
So you can see those nice long purple tongues. Uh, those are prehensile, so they're used to kind of rip all the leaves off of a tree branch. Uh, and you'll notice what color are they? Oh, here they're comes purple. Mr. Julian. Purple, yes. Uh, so that is a form of uh, sunscreen. So if you're walking around, sticking your tongue out all day long, um, it could potentially get sunburned. Uh, yeah. So that dark color has a lot of pigment in there, so it helps protect it from the sun. Uh, this is Jaleel. This is our male here uh, that just come, ca uh, came to join us. Uh, and he will hang out, all of these guys will hang out with you as long as you have a head of lettuce here. <laughs> Alright Cruz, what'd you think? I thought it was really cool. I was interested how long their tongues were. So their tongues can be up to 18 inches long. So about, about yeah. that long or so. Because um, they're reaching out, you know, grabbing all of those leaves off of the branches. Um, so yeah, about 18 inches long. Um, so, I, I, I'm so glad you got to meet our giraffe today. Uh, you know, you guys can come out to the zoo and feed a giraffe. Uh, and we hope that, that you'll come visit us soon here at the Birmingham Zoo. So now I'm here with my friend Ann. So what are we looking at right here? So this is Wakanian. Wakanian is a black vulture who lives here at the Birmingham Zoo, but we are so lucky to have them living all around us here in Alabama and the rest of the southeastern United States. Do you have any guesses where else you could find him? No, I don't really know much about vultures, so. Well, it's good you're here with us at the zoo. Vultures have amazing adaptations, which help them live here in the southern United States, as well as all the way through Central and South America. And not only that, but they have some amazing things that we're gonna demonstrate for you that make them amazing flyers and scavengers. Now, what do you think makes Wakanian a good scavenger? I don't know. Well, he's got that beautiful wingspan, right? Yeah. Would you like to go ahead and demonstrate it for us? So, uh, okay. Uh. So while you get your wingspan on, we'll tell you a little bit more about it. So birds like Wakanian can have wingspans of from up to four to five feet. That's about as tall as my whole body and probably about um, as, the same for you, although you're a little bit taller than yeah. I am. They also have their beautiful feathers. What an awesome adaptation. Now, what do you think their feathers help birds do? Um, fly, maybe? Fly, right. And Wakanians are what color? Black. They're black. So if it's towards the morning time when it's kind of cold out, he can spread those wings out nice and far and get a good amount of sunlight to help warm him up. See, you're already an awesome vulture. Now, he's got other amazing adaptations. And one great way to show them off is to give Wakanian a vulture handshake. Okay, so how do you do that? Put your hand in a little fist just like this, and he'll do the rest. <laughs> so Watt Canyon feels comfortable giving a nice handshake like that because he is always sticking his beak into body cavities. As a scavenger, he's looking for anything dead that has died. So to help him, he's got a nice sharp beak. Okay. And he also has a very bald head, which seems kind of weird, but it is super important so that no germs or bacteria or diseases get onto him as he's sticking his head into things that have already died. Now that beak also helps for other turkey vultures. So Wakanian's a black vulture, but for turkey vultures, they have an amazing sense of smell compared to a lot of other birds. So turkey vultures will actually scope out and look for turkey, or sorry, black vultures will scope out and look for turkey vultures. And when turkey vultures smell something, they will fly down and take advantage of the meal. The last really, really important adaptation they have is around their stomach and thinking of what they're eating. So since they're looking for dead decaying material to help clean up the environment, their stomach is filled with incredibly strong stomach acid. It has a pH of zero, which is stronger than battery acid. Why don't you go ahead and check out what's in your stomach? Okay. Got some sponge and a mouse. And this should say? Acid. So we've got acid to digest maybe some little dead mouse, which is called carrion. And don't forget, they're watching those turkey vultures 
So they've got to have some good eyesight to pick up on it. Now, if they spot anything else that may be a threat, they need to defend themselves. How do you think they could defend themselves? Their claws. That's a great guess, but they're going to do something a little more ingenious. They can throw up on their prey. Yup, you heard it right. So their stomach acid is really important. Wow, that's really crazy. Now I bet I'm a vulture. <laughs> I bet you never thought that you would become a vulture to mm -hmm. learn about one, huh? Nope. But there are so many amazing adaptations and reasons to love black vultures like Wakanian. Most only live to be about 25 years old. Wakanian is over 30, so we are very lucky to have him here with us. And to keep protecting them, there are other vulture safe programs at zoos and aquariums, which stands for Saving Animals from Extinction. And you can help support by telling your friends what you've learned and helping out during International Vulture Awareness Day in September. I could say that I've always wanted to be a veterinarian uh, since I was a little girl, about four years old. Um, I always wanted to work with animals, especially uh, and especially work with people. Veterinary medicine was able to combine those things for me. I made the decision when I was probably in middle school. So with STEM and technology, veterinary medicine has grown to be able to do so many different things that we haven't been able to do for years. We have multiple different uh, technologies in terms of how we diagnose different diseases. We can catch it so early before, uh, for a long time, we were able to only catch it when a dog or cat was significantly sick, um, in which we're then just treating the problem. Well now, with so much advancements in technology, we're able to um, catch that so much earlier to where we can do something about it ahead of time before that animal is sick. My favorite part of my job is being able to build relationships. I've built a lot of relationships, not just with the people that I work with in my field, but also uh, people that I call my clients are really a part of the vet care family. They come in every day, they call me um, every day. Um, I, talk to, I talk about their animals and I talk to them as if they're my extended family members and being able to continue to grow those relationships and meet new people and develop even more relationships. So um, I definitely love that part of my job to where I can see and talk to my favorite people about my favorite pets every day. <laughs> Hi, I'm Neil, and Sophia and I are here at the Hudson Alpha Institute for Biotechnology in Huntsville, Alabama. Is it just me, or is it really chilly in here? I, I don't, I'm not cold at all. I feel nice and toasty. I'm freezing. You know, part of it might be because <laughs> of the way you and I are dressed. Maybe. You know, humans can adjust their body, their, their temperature, how warm or cold they are in their surroundings, by what they put on or what they take off. Animals can't do that same thing. Animals, by and large, except maybe for you know, people's dogs that wear <laughs> sweaters and things, but most animals don't have clothing that they can put on or take off. So how do animals figure out how to stay warm in the winter? I've always wondered that. Let's get rid of some of this stuff and put some <laughs> things out here on the table, and we'll come back and we'll talk about that very thing. <laughs> Sophia, uh, hold up your hand. So we've done some interesting things to your fingers here. I've got a bowl of ice water that I'm gonna have Sophia put her hand in in just a second. But with each of your fingers, except for your pointer finger, which we've left on its own as our kind of control test, we've, done, we've wrapped your finger in something to see if it actually provides some sort of insulation or if it helps keep your hands warm. You've got a balloon on your thumb that we put some air into. Uh, your middle finger is, uh, is wrapped in uh, fake fur and your ring finger is surrounded by pom-poms. Your pinky, we wrapped in cling film. Each of these may give you some layer of insulation against this really cold container of ice water. So go ahead, see. stick your fingers in. Oh. Okay, I'm gonna, I'm gonna you know, give you just a second to you know, catch your breath. Uh, you can feel that it's cold, yes. I can't really feel anything on my pinky finger. It still feels warm. Um, the same for my thumb, but my pointer finger is really cold. Yeah, because there's <laughs> nothing on your pointer finger except for that glove, right? 
Okay, I won't make you leave it in there much longer, but how do the rest <laughs> of your fingers feel? They feel pretty good. The only one that's really cold is my pointer. <laughs> okay, all right, going ahead and pull that out. Dry your hand off a second. And then I'm going to have you put your other hand in, and I'm okay. going to have you um, wear this vegetable shortening <laughs> mitten. Now, this is vegetable shortening. Um, it, it, it's vegetable oil. Uh, it's, uh, it's a fat, and it uh, creates a layer of insulation uh, between, hopefully, between you and the cold water. So let's take okay. your other hand, put it into the, the mitten. Now, there's no, there's a clear layer of plastic in, so she's not actually sticking her hand directly <laughs> into, into the, the vegetable shortening. And stick it in the water. I can't feel a thing. Yeah, so it's a pretty good insulator. <laughs> it is. Isn't it? That layer of, of, of vegetable shortening. All right, let's set that off to the side and let me pull out an image about how animals in the wild stay warm. So when animals, when it's cold, animals have multiple different options for how they keep their bodies warm. Birds use feathers. Animals like otters use fur. Uh, wolves and bears often use fur. Some animals use a layer of fat, like whales or, or bears as well. They, they um, eat a lot in the fall to give themselves a layer of fat. Each one of those provides some level of insulation, just like the different things that we did with your hand. Feathers and fur actually trap a layer of air up close to the body and provide that warm space before the outside air. So that's just like, like this. Just like that. And like the, the balloon on your thumb that has some warm air around it and the air that was trapped in the fur, the pom-poms, and that we trapped when we wrapped it in cling film. Other animals use a layer of fat, much like the vegetable shortening that we used. And that provides a level of insulation between them and the cold air or the cold water. Now, we're going to take our... Um, uh, our vegetable shortening mitten up a notch, and we're actually gonna do an entire blubber suit. Um, <laughs> so I'm gonna put on an entire outfit filled with vegetable shortening, and then see how well that protects me against both cold air and cold water. Um, that's gonna be something that's a bit different than what we've done on the show before. Uh, and uh, Are you excited? Uh, I am both excited and actually a little bit apprehensive <laughs> because I know it involves you knocking me into a dunk tank of cold water at the end. But shall we go out and prep for that? We shall. All right. <laughs> hey, it's Sophia, and I'm here with Neil at Summer Fun in Huntsville, Alabama. And it's really, really cold outside. <laughs> yeah, Sophia, it's about 48 degrees outside, but I'm actually pretty warm in this blubber suit. Don't I wish you, I could say the same. Don't you like it? I mean, isn't it I love fashionable? It. it is. This was developed and crafted by Catherine Lanier based on a design by Molly Langston. And it's really spectacular. It's amazing. It's about 40 pounds filled with vegetable shortening, but it actually does a really great job of insulating me against the cold breeze. Now, we'll see how it does when I go get up in the water. Okay. Are, are you gonna like really slam that dunk tank target and drop me in hard? Yes, I'm excited. <laughs> oh, okay, well, let's go. Sophia, are you ready? I'm pretty ready, what about you? Uh, that water <laughs> looks really cold, but yes, hang on just a second. Okay, you gonna give me a countdown? Um, yes. Okay. Five, four. <laughs> That was not fair! It's not as cold as I thought it would be. So I think the blubber suit actually works. I think it works too. But you're not going to want to put this on now. Yeah, I think I'm good. I'm <laughs> staying okay. away. So now we know how animals stay warm in the winter. Feathers, fur, and fat. Thanks for watching Alabama STEM Explorers. If you missed anything or you want to watch something again, you can check out our website at alabamastemexplorers.org. Maybe you have a question we could answer here on the show and you might grab a cool t-shirt. Feel free to send us a video question or an email on our website, alabamastemexplorers.org. Thanks again for watching. We'll be back next week.
Development STEM Explorers is made possible by the generous support of the Hudson Alpha Institute for Biotechnology, translating the power of genomics into real-world results. Southern Research, solving the world's hardest problems. The Hawley Family Foundation, established to honor the legacy of Brigadier General Everett Hawley and his parents, Evelyn and Fred Hawley, champions of servant leadership. Alabama Works, a network of interconnected providers connecting business and industry needs to a highly skilled and trained workforce. Alabama STEM Council, dedicated to improving STEM education, career awareness, and workforce development across Alabama. Alabama Mathematics, Science, Technology, and Engineering Coalition for Education Advocating for Exceptional STEM Education in Alabama. Alabama Math, Science, and Technology Initiative, the Alabama Department of Education's initiative to improve math and science teaching statewide. 